Hello, everyone. I am Deep Medi. I'm the organizer of SKC Science and Technology webinar series. Uh, we have been running this for about a year now. And today it's my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Ion Bortakur as the speaker. And um, Ion did uh, his undergraduate from IIT Dhanbad in electrical engineering and then recently completed PhD from Cornell University in USA. He is now a senior neuromorphic uh, engineer uh, at Inatera Nanosystem. Hope I got it right. And he's uh, located in uh, Netherlands and commonly we call it Holland. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting topic. I wanted uh, 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 you know, more people to know about it uh, in a very exciting new area at the intersection of computational biology and computer science. And so as uh, we do with uh, our webinar series, this is a fireside chat format, very informal way. And to have it uh, accessible to a broader set of audience. So with that, Ion, I think has a set of slides he's going to go over and talk through it. And if you have any question, you can uh, drop it in the chat box. And I'll also once in a while interject and ask Ion to clarify a few things. And at the end, we can open it up for, 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 for more audio questions at the end. Okay, good, Ion. So everything is good. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me start with this. Uh, you can hear me, right? Everything is fine? Yep. Everything is good. Okay. Yep. So today, I'm going to talk about what we can we learn about the sense of smell through neuromorphic AI. Now, this is a very new field. There are many things which we are still unsure. So there are many, there'll be many questions. Feel free to ask me, I'll try to answer. But just keep that in mind. <laughs> so my talk will be divided into four sections. A very brief intro. What is neuromorphic? I'll talk a bit, bit about olfaction, the sense of smell, and how actually we should study sensory systems. What are the constraints? Very briefly summary. You might see that I have a lot of slides, but I don't intend to complete uh, all of these slides. Don't worry. So what is this research about? So we are trying to reverse engineer the Mabelian olfactory system as an AI system. Um, as you can understand, it's a very interdisciplinary effort. I'm myself an electrical engineer, and this work requires understanding neuroscience, psychology, and computer science too. And when I say mammal, I'm, we are actually using the rodent, mice olfactory system to study the. There's some similarities with humans too, but there are some dissimilarities too. Now, approaches for designing AI systems. How do you design an AI system? Well, it can be done in many different ways. Think about, uh, let's think of this line. So the left side is a way where we don't look at brain at all. There are algorithms like decision trees which don't care about the brain, and that is fine. There are some really good applications. And the right end is, is the place where you try to replicate the brain as it is. It's a bit, it sounds very weird, but maybe people can get right. Now, where are we? We are somewhere here. Why? Because we are trying to design spiky neural network algorithm for AI systems. Don't worry, I'm going to describe what spiky neural network after some time. And why are we designing spiky neural network, which in short we call SNN? Because two reasons. One is more for neuroscience and for AI both. You want to understand the architectural priors and the learning mechanisms supporting learning in the wild. I'm going to explain what learning in the wild is. And the other is we want to implement this algorithms in various neuromorphic chips. I'm going to explain all of these things. Just I'm telling what I'm doing. So very good. Very good. Neuromorphic. What exactly is neuromorphic? Right? We need to understand. And I'm sure for many this is a very new world. Even for me, when I got first got introduced to the field in 2012, I was an electrical engineer. I was studying on the electric circuits. And then I got did an internship with INI Zurich, and that's how I came to know about this field. So on the the person that you see is the father of neuromorphic engineering. He's a professor at Caltech, his government is very old now. So he pioneered VLSI design, which is very large scale integrated system design. Now, because of this technology, 
we can take hundreds of transistors, thousands of transistors into a silicon chip. And that created a revolution in the semiconductor industry. But he was not happy after that. He said that the CPUs are very energy consuming and over time, the energy consumption is going to increase. That is a problem. We need to find better solutions. So he started looking at the brain. So the main motivation of designing neuromorphic chips actually is to reduce power dissipation of chips by mimicking the massively parallel computing architecture of the brain. That was the main motivation of studying neuromorphic back in 1989, around that time. So his students started studying this. So it's very new in that sense. 30 years in a science is a really, really, really new area. Very good. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky. So his students started working in this field at Caltech. And a lot of branch of the students actually moved to Zurich. And I was lucky to be trained by one of those. That's how I got introduced to this field. And what exactly is neuromorphic? That's what I'm going to describe now here. What exactly is neuromorphic engineering and computing? There's a difference between engineering and computing, so that's why I have this hyphen here, slash here. So you have this brain, and you have this beautiful picture that you see, which are comprised of neurons and wires. Now, these kind of diagrams are drawn by Ramonik Kahal back in early 1900s. These are old, 1900 is old, but these, are these diagrams are relevant even now. And he did some really hard, like very good work on mimicking this brain. And in neuromorphic engineering, we take inspiration for the brain. We try to implement those neurons and synapses mostly in this neuromorphic chips. So on the right, you see two neuromorphic chips. One of them is IBM True North, and the other is Kapaho Bay. These are digital neuromorphic chips, and these are not the only ones. I didn't have enough space to include more. Even Inatara has our own chip now. So <laughs> there are many chips. Just and the idea is that you create computing devices mimicking the biological nervous system in silicon, mostly in silicon. Why? Primarily to build efficient neural network processing systems. Efficiency in terms of power and speed, we want low power consumption, high speed. And the other is to understand the brain by building, by implementing it in silicon. The idea is that you look at the brain, implementing, implement it in silicon, and then you'll understand it better. That's the main idea. That's kind of an immense way of thinking about science. So, so, so I want a quick question here. Uh, why is the power important? Can you quickly elaborate on that? Why uh, I will power efficient? Give me a few slides. Okay, great. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I have that. Uh, I'll first talk about why it is low power and then why it is, why it is important. That's so good. neuromorphic chips are comprised of silicon neurons and synapses. These are the, uh, on the left, you see a biological neuron. And we, this is something we study in our school level, right? We have the dendrites receiving information. The soma processes this information spikes, pass around the exon through the synapse to other neurons. And on the right, you see an, a silicon neuron. And here on the graph, you see the x-axis this time and y-axis is membrane voltage. And this dynamics, this membrane potential rise and fall kind of things that you see are observed in biological neuron and they can be also realized, you can also observe this in these silicon neurons. And the idea is that this physics of silicon can be exploited for application of neural dynamics. So you can get this dynamics here, and this is not the only neuron type. There are many different neuron types. I'm showing you only one. And as you can see, it's an old way. Now, neuron cell synapse from the competing units of neuromorphic chips, and these are suitable for massively parallel tasks. Okay. But the question is, you are designing it in silicon. Why are you doing it? Silicon implementation is costly. Like, so ideas that we want to the goal is to sell semiconductor chips. So you want to use it for some real world applications and then sell it. That's a goal. And the secondary goal is to use, understand the brain. So people do both and there are some academic teams who are doing that. Now, the question is, first question, why it is low power? And uh, so here, this analog neuron here, and you have this transistors here. Now, transistors are everywhere. Transistors are widely used to form circuits and central CPUs and these phones that we have there. We have transistors there. And transistors are operated in switch mode in all of these cases. So when I say switch mode, uh, what I mean is that you have this transistor gate drain and source. The x-axis is the gate to source voltage and y-axis is the current. And transistors in switch mode are operated above threshold in this domain where the drain to source current is constant. Now, as you can see, this gate to source voltage is higher. And carbon and steam observed 
that if you operate the transistors in lower voltage, this is the sub threshold domain, definitely the voltage is at lower. So overall, if you have a lot of these transistors, the power consumption will be low. This is the mm -hmm. sub domain. Mm -hmm. And other interesting thing is that in this region, you can replicate neuronal dynamics. The dynamics of the transistors, the output that you get of the current, they are have an exponential rise and fall kind of dynamics like the neurons. And if you combine a lot of them like here, and you can design intelligence neurons and synapses. That was the idea. And in fact, the chips that we have for neuromorphic and long neuromorphic chips, the power consumption is in picozoles. It's super low. None I of the see. other very microprocessors. Low, very low. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's our main motivation of doing neuromorphic. Mm -hmm. So sub dynamics of transistors are exploited to mimic biology and design low power neuromorphic chips. That is the one of the idea. Other is, it's something we are much more familiar in computer science. Uh, we have the von Neumann computer architecture. We have the CPU and the memory, almost all of our computer set, and they are separated by bus. And that concept consumes time. And people, all of in computer architecture, we know that at some point we'll have to move to non von Neumann computing architecture. We have already started doing that in some way in CPUs and all. So, brain is not, brain, the idea is that the brain doesn't work in this way. Brain is a non von Neumann computing architecture. You have the neurons and the synapse, which are the memory. So neurons are the computing units and the synapse are the memory. So memory and computation are co-localized here in this type of neuromorphic computers. That kind of also speeds up the computation and also energy because you don't have to use this bus. Now, people do it in different ways. Some are totally analog neuromorphic chips, some are mixed signal analog chips and they are digital. So the power consumption level is also different for these kind of chips. Now this kind of architectures and there are a few other things which like ensures low power and low latency for this kind of chips, neuromorphic chips. Now, question is so why do I want I to- I guess the, the main message here from your picture tells you something because uh, all computers, as you know, is the, the von Neumann architecture, we call it uses a bus. Bus means basically a connection between memory and CPU and the hard drive and whatnot, right? But here the connection yeah. cannot be on a single, what we call a bus. Um, many people might wonder who are not in the field of architecture, what a bus means. It's really bus means like a bus in a, on a road, basically. You go from one point to another one. That's why they use the terminology. But as you can see on the picture on the right, that you know when you have the neurons there, they're not connected in one place. It's like many cities are connected or many points are connected. So you cannot just do one bus. It's like all like a roads, basically many roads there. Uh, does that make sense? Is that, did I capture it yes. correctly? Um, okay, go ahead. Yes. Please. Now I'm going to tell why, where this is useful. Uh, Neuromorphic has many applications. One of them is edge computing and all, but I'm going to talk about two applications, which are very like, I like it a lot. And there's something I want to do it. And I've been doing it for some time. One is brain machine interface and prosthetics. Here application of Neuromorphic is very useful. Many reasons. One, you need to know neuroscience. You need to understand how neural code, the information from the prosthetic interface has been coded, how it's been transformed, especially in closed loop systems. And here you need low power consumptions, right? You have this battery, you want to use this prosthetics for a long time. And to do, the, do that, you want little power consumption by the battery. So we call this always on scenario. We don't want to turn off the system. So that's why we need low power. We need fast computations. We cannot wait, expect a lot of delay. Definitely lightweight. We cannot, we don't want the prosthetic to be very heavy. And from an algorithm perspective, we want algorithms that are adaptive. Now, brain machine interface, if you look, most of the uh, current brain machine interface are like, they're not commercializable yet. They are like, uh, it comes from our lab. There are a few prototypes, but they are not ready for commercialization. And when I talk to people who are doing brain machine interface, like, with my friends in Berkeley and all, they say these are kind of the limitations right now, few limitations. Definitely we need better science, but also we need adaptive algorithms. By adaptive, I mean, you can go ahead. You had a question. A quick question here, Ion, which is that uh, obviously at this point, there are prosthetics that you can move the arms or legs and they are not based on neuromorphics. So what's the technology is there? Quick, quickly, can you tell it? And what would be the advantage of using neuromorphic engineering there compared to that, when it is ready, of course. So 
mostly then uh, if we are working, uh, it is the second second point, mm -hmm. low power. Mm -hmm. So right now the algorithms that people generally are considering are called ensemble methods, decision trees. Mm -hmm. cool. And they have some very specialized computer architectures, which kind of sell well. So it works well for now, but it's like, I would say I, we are not at a stage where we can keep it always on. It's like, they need to be constantly, you need a battery power. That's, correct. That's one of the requirements. Mm -hmm. right. And other challenge that you are having right now is adaptivity, adaptability. So it's something we want to solve using, it is more an algorithmic problem. So you have this brain machine interface, you have a particular algorithm to do a particular kind of movement. But with time, the signals which you are using to do the classification for this movement, that change. Our brain is adapting. So the signal is changing, which means you need to update your net algorithm too. Right. And that update, if you have to take care of your prosthetics, that becomes hard. So mm -hmm. what you want is like that happens in your body. Like it gets those update happens using on chip learning. What this is what Correct. we want. Okay, good. Right. So, so uh, going to one of the questions in the chat box is that one of the application of neuromorphic, neuromorphic engineering is precisely the example you're showing it here, where having a neuro, uh, neuromorphic chip is going to allow with a very low power, much better way to be able to do something in terms of arm movement or leg movement uh, than what we can do it right now with uh, you know, the current technology which still looks very impressive, but it's very power consuming, but it's based on certain type of algorithm, you know, basically action, but it would be, it's not quite fully natural with the current set of uh, algorithm and mechanism that's used. So there are two things here, which mm -hmm. one, uh, so actually I should make it more clear. One of them is the neomorphic part, which is right. where we care about loop and, and other is the algorithmic part. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the algorithmic part, and actually the algorithm that I'm going to talk about, we are motivated to do neuromorphic, but that doesn't mean we cannot implement that algorithm in some other hardware. So we can also implement this algorithm that I'm going to describe that was part of a PhD in a Raspberry Pi. We did that. So, really? or a GPU. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so okay. that's sort of concern. So algorithmically, we can do it and implement those algorithms and other chips, but if you do, because they are already spiking, those algorithms, I'm going to describe what spiking is later. Neuromorphic chips are spiking, so we can easily port it to there. That was the idea. But definitely we can engineer those algorithms, few things, and we can, if you are in a scenario where say we are fine with using a ZPU, we can use it. That's sort of a big concern from the algorithm perspective. So, so the, the question is, can this technique be used in robotics also? That's another question. Next thing. Up. <laughs> Next <Very> thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. It's, you might be covering so, it. Right so how did you guess that that's going to be your next slide? Okay, very good, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so right. that is my main motivation, one of my main motivation to get into, when I got into neuromorphic robotics. Right. So okay. I got, uh, so I was on robotics and I, so as you can see, this is a smelling robot. That's one of the idea. I studied the sense of smell. So we want this robot, suppose a space suit which can smell. Mm -hmm. So, so there, the in fact, I like it's already going. So instead of your mouse, a robot is smelling something now, right? So, okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. So apparently the nose that is, this robot is going to have is a rodent, a mice nose, not a human ah, nose. Interesting, interesting. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. Because rodents, uh, their olfactory system are much more advanced than humans. We humans, they're dependent a lot on the sense of smell. Mm, I see. Interesting, very interesting. So, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so for why neuromorphic for robotics is same. We want low power, fast computation, and lightweight. But algorithmically, why we want learning in the wild, that's the word I'm going to use from now. I'm going to describe. But that is the algorithm part. And in robotics, the, so when, uh, when uh, in robotics learning, there's tell, the problem with current ANN, the artificial neural network, is that they are data hungry. They need a lot of samples to learn from. Now, that's a problem when a robot is navigating through space and it has to learn something new. It has to learn ideally very quickly and from very few examples, which we call one or few shots. Now, definitely there is some work going on in one or few shots, but that's one of the requirements that 
of learning in the wild that we want the algorithm to run from very few examples and robotics required that. And the other very important thing which is involved is online learning without get yourself forgetting. What does it mean? It's, so I guess that current ANN, if I train an ANN, say with apple orange, and then I expose the network to apple orange later, it's going to say it is apple and orange, fine. But later, but if I take the network with this ANN with apple only, and then up we do testing, whatever, and then we train the network later with orange, it's going to forget apple. That is called catastrophic forgetting. Ha ha ha! Because you did it all, with it only one domain or one topical thing, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's but that's not how uh, brains work. Mostly, live, uh, whether it is rodent or even humans, we do we do not forget previous learning things. We have a forgetting mechanisms, but like mostly, we don't forget things. <laughs> so we are trying to have this feature as part of learning the why. That's one of the reasons we are looking at the Mavenet olfactory system. How why learning is different. In the uh, mm -hmm. or in the humans. Mm -hmm. So, and we want this feature in this kind of algorithm, which will be used for robotics. So, that's the idea online learning without catastrophic forgetting. So, it's very interesting. The next set of robots, you know, will be able to do something like that. You know, so, yep, exciting, very exciting. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I mean, work on this has already started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's something we have been doing, for, thinking about for the last two years now. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And now, okay, we have this, I showed you the applications, I showed you the chips, that this is how our neural chips are. Now we, software, designing a software stack is not a big problem. The problem, hurdle is, if you have to make use of this chips for some AI, we need algorithms. That's very important. Now, neuromorphic is a radically different approach of designing algorithms. And why? One example I'm saying, we are kind of used to doing matrix multiplication in machine learning. Tensor, we just do it by, we don't, like we probably don't realize it, whether it is SBM or any ANN, we do a lot of tensor matrix multiplication operations. And that matrix multiply, multiply equivalent operation is a very energy consuming process. And that's it. In fact, GPUs so we are very, get it that. Yeah, especially GPUs are very commonly used for any extensive matrix multiplication type things right now yeah and that's why gpus have become very popular but you're right gpus are extremely power consuming right so that's what it is yeah mm -hmm. now that's not how the brain works so <laughs> they support spike-based computation spike-based network update mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a bit different and that forces us to think differently about algorithms like you are not going to do matrix multiplication you need to think about algorithms whether it be learning or inference in terms of spikes how this is happening in terms of spikes and this is where we need to study neuroscience and psychology too, to a great extent. Now, definitely, uh, there are some exposures which are more like you got inspired from neuroscience. I do that too sometimes. And then you said, okay, we can stop here and then we can do an engineering design, which is fine. So it is not that we will try to be 100% biologically possible. That might not be always possible. And that's my focus today. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about biologically inspired networks, yeah. which is where we can try to understand the spike-based communication, spike-based network update. But, but I have a very good point. Let me recap something here, what you just said, which is that, you know, sometimes we get ingrained in our training to look at a problem in a certain ways. And you ex gave the example about matrix multiplication because that's what we know. And our computer chips are, the way we have designed it, those are, you know, we know how to do it. And suddenly we are facing a new domain like neuromorphic computing where that model actually does not work well. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, including power being one of them. So uh, the, the interesting thing about what you are about probably more going to say about it is that, that, uh, that we always need to think in a sense outside, of, outside the box because we got trained in a certain way to look at something, even as a human, although our brains are you know, not uh, designed that way, but we just forget that there are other ways to look at a problem. So, uh, so I just want to kind of recap that and you can of course uh, correct me if I said something wrong uh, before you move on to your next set of slides. 
Yeah. So there's one more thing which I didn't include here, but I think I should mention here. This is not the only feature. So I want the other feature which everybody in AI community is saying. In traditional ANN, we usually start with a fully connected network. Like whenever we apply backprop, we from, from, go from first layer to last layer. And again, come when I do backprop, we are going back to all the layers. That is not a signature of brain. Brain doesn't do it in that way. So usually what happens in the brain is, first thing, it is reconfigurable. You have this group of neurons and you can use a subset of those network for some tasks and then reconfigure it for some other task. It's called reconfigurable computing. And ideal other thing is, uh, reasons that are very closely, like very active, always. Two reasons, if they're, they'll be very strongly connected. And the reasons that are not very active will be weakly connected. They don't have a lot of connections. And that is also desirable from a hardware point of view because you can reduce the amount of wiring. And along this line, there's a thing called, which we call local learning. Brain does a lot of local learning instead of global learning. So we use this terminology in computational neuroscience. So there is there are a lot of work going on right now where we are trying to make artificial neural network algorithm backup more local. So that's a very interesting direction going on, like trying to make those algorithms more local. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's one direction. Uh, there are a few other points, <laughs> uh, but it's fine for now. So this is neuromorphic. <laughs> it's a very brief introduction about neuromorphic. <laughs> But I think you have understood what, why we are doing neuromorphic and what are the basics. Now, next is olfaction, which is the sense of smell. So this will be a much more biology thing. And when it, the idea, so whenever you see anything with smelling, you'll see the word olfactory, just so you know. Now, the question is why I decided to study olfaction. So, I got introduced into this field as an electrical engineer. I learned about this neuromorphic, but then one of the thing I realized is that I need to understand the, we need to understand the brain better. We have these neurons, we have the synapses, but that is not enough. Nothing magical is going to happen. We need to understand how this our system is working. Now, I, start, I first started studying the visual system, but uh, it might be a cultural difference, but visual system, we don't know much about the micro security even now. New tools are coming up like optogenetics. So we don't know much about uh, V1, V2. From a system perspective, we know it. So actually there's a very nice paper that we know only 15% of the V1. So <laughs> that kind of motivated me to move towards olfaction. And in olfaction, people know a lot about the micro security, the learning roles. And I joined Cornell for studying olfaction. <laughs> and I, the first thing I did was learn psychology, learn computational neuroscience. And the problem that we were been trying to solve is what is learning in the wild. That is what we call olfactory heart problem. What exactly is this? I'm going to describe now. So let's imagine a fox looking for a prey. Like it's looking for a prey. The odor interest can be strong. What you see here, that left option which means the order is very close to the fox, it is also visible, you have the visual input too. That's an easy problem. You can easily identify the order, like the target. Or the order of interest will be weak. This is the scenario. You have high background interference, which means you have the smell of the prey, but you don't know where it is. You need, and there are a lot of background interference. There will be a scenario where that prey smell will be totally new. You might have to learn it, and you might have to update. You have to do it very quickly and rapidly. When all of these constraints come, order sensing becomes a very hard problem. That is the olfactory hard problem we say, which is learning in the wild. And we are trying to solve this problem. Now, it is definitely a very, very complicated problem. It's not that we have solved everything of this problem. But so another way to say about thing. the learning in the wild is that it's not in the lab. You know, lab is a much controlled environment. So learning in the wild is out there, you know, when you're trying to actually try to do it. So it makes it problem much more difficult because you don't have a controlled environment from a, you know, a measurement point of view, right? So. So apparently just so you know, I went to a workshop. We talked about learning in the wild, but then I realized I need to formally define learning in the wild. So I wrote a paper on how to define learning in the wild. So Very if good. you look online for learning in the wild, you'll probably find my paper. Okay, good. So. okay. 
uh, now the, uh, we want to understand the olfactory system. Now, how do we think about this? We have this odor space. Somehow they are being recognized by the olfactory system. The question is how? Now, it is a mystery for a long time. <laughs> how does our sense of smell work? What is happening? So in nine, 1991, Linda Buck and Richard Excel at Columbia University. Ex Richard Excel is still at Columbia. He discovered these genes, thousand different types of genes located at the olfactory receptors here. And these receptors, uh, these genes at the receptors can detect the molecular chemical ion, which actually trans, uh, can, which can help transfer the information to the other brain regions. So what you see here on below is the air molecules being very close to the odor receptors. So odor, the genes are helping them identify these odors. And that information is now transmitted along after through this bone to this brain region, which I'm going to describe later. Don't worry. I'm just trying to see that odors, the molecules here, are de detected by some genes. And these are very interesting circuits. The reason because we had, one of our goal is to design electronic nodes. And as part of this, we want, also need better sensors. We need to design sensors. And apparently, the sensors that we have are way more inferior to, compared to these genes coding sensors. These are very, very good sensors. The sensors that we have in our dental olfactory system. It's, these are like, they can detect a lot of chemicals, which probably the sensors cannot do it. So actually, there are one or two labs. What they are doing is they're actually trying to remove this olfactory receptors from the brain, like from rodents, and trying to use it in some electronic nodes. They're trying to somehow preserve these receptors. Now, definitely there are limitations when you remove these uh, genes from the system, but people are working on this because they're really good receptors. They're very good at detecting odors. And as I said, this information from the receptors is transferred to the higher brain regions. Now, just so you know, research Excel has done a lot of good work in olfaction. And I was last two weeks ago, I read a paper from his lab about prefrontal cortex. So he has been doing some exciting work even now. So he's a very good smell scientist to follow. And so, okay, so these are the olfactory receptors. They have received the odor. Now, what about the odor properties? Uh, this is something which is related to pharmacology. I'm still learning. It's a very new thing, but it's very interesting. You need to know a lot of pharmacology to actually understand odor recognition. <laughs> so what is uh, what you have here is odor A. This is simulated odor. These are these different colors indicate different level of activation of the receptors. And you can see this response over time A. And this is order B. And you can see that order A and order B, think of order A as orange and B as say apple. Might not be the best apple, but an apple. B is different. And their responses are different. So it looks like we can easily identify A and B somehow, some algorithm. And but if you have both A and B in the nature, that can be a problem. Now, if B, uh, what we say is that if order B is an antagonist, which blocks order A. Recognizing A and B from a mixture of A plus B, A and B, A plus B will be very, very difficult. In computation neuroscience, then we say that we need to, we have to, if you have to discriminate between them, we actually need learning. So learning is a very important com compatible faction. And in fact, learning in old, from what I have observed right now, learning in the olfactory system is much more important than visual system right now. So the assumption is that visual system have it has a lot of hard-coded pathways, but that's not the case in olfaction. It is learning dependent. I see. Mm -hmm. So learning can help you discriminate between, and this uh, under analogy I should tell you here, orange and tangerine, very similar. They're not much difference. So if you learn orange, you'll say tangerine is similar to that. You'll know, not know the difference. And if you haven't learned tangerine, but if you have learned both orange and tangerine, you'll be able to learn the differences. So that's the analogy we use. You know, Very interesting action. point about orange and tangerine, right? That's right. Smell is much more difficult than the visual system, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Other thing we have to keep in mind is that there is similarity-based learning here, which I'm not mm -hmm. going to talk here, but that's very important in biology, similarity-based yeah. learning. Mm -hmm. So now these are the receptors, order state-based. I described the state space and orders. The other thing is that how is this information interpreted in the brain? How do you understand this, right? So there is some kind of coding going on. What kind of coding? So 
This is a very important paper by Horace Barlow. This is single unit and sensation on neuron doctrine for perceptual psychology. In 1972, Horace Barlow proposed in this paper that the sensory system is organized to achieve as complete a representation of the sensory stimulus as possible with the minimum number of active neurons. So you have this order or whatever that is, that sensory stimulus uh, will be coded with the minimum number of active neurons. Now, I'll be a bit careful when I say this because this was a hypothesis in 1972 and few things have changed from now. Like till now, few things have changed, but the idea is there that our order, you have these neurons, but not all orders, neurons, uh, neurons are used to code this order. Few neurons will be used to code the information and you actually try to do it optimal. So optimal coding hypothesis. Now, this is hypothesis. In early 90s, David Pill, who is one of my advisors at Cornell, he actually proved that this is correct with some modification. That he's, and he termed this as sparse coding. This is in visual system, but this also applies, a lot of these things also applies to olfaction. So neural coding hypothesis. Now we're not done yet. Other thing is what are the different types of neural codes? So think of, so the circles that you see here is a neurons. It's a neurons and black ones are spiking. They're active neurons, others are not active neurons. So in dense codes, you have all of the neurons participating. So you can represent to prepare any information. And then the other extreme is the local code where only one neuron is coding an order, some, an app. Now, which one is the optimal? Dense code is not good because uh, if a lot of neurons are participating, there'll be a lot of energy consumption. Spike is an energy uh -huh. consuming right. process. Mm -hmm. So dense code is not good and it is not at all efficient. Is local code, code good? No. So some years ago, you might have heard of an experiment which was actually misinterpreted by the media. It's, the experimenters were not doing that. So they say Jennifer Aniston neuron. So they showed the person Jennifer Aniston's picture and that a particular neuron is spiking. And they said that, oh, you have a grandmother cell here in the brain. That's not true. Now this, why do you, so the reason I, we say this is bad is because the coding capacity is less. We need, we can code only N stimulus. And the other is if this neuron dies, we cannot identify, identify this. That's not robust. This is not at a robust coding. So the kind of coding that is optimal is sparse distributed codes. A subset of the neurons are coding their information. Now, as you can see, this was in 1995. So sparse distributed code still exists. But apparently, <laughs> that's part of the PhD actually, even these K neurons that are active and are coding a particular order, they can code multiple orders, multiple stimulus. And that can be done using timing, timing-based coding. And that's my, I didn't discover it, but that is a big part of my PhD, mm -hmm. timing-based coding. And that also increases the coding capacity a lot. Mm -hmm. So this is how neurons are coded, sparse distributed codex, uh, codes, and timing is important. We need to keep that in mind. Now, next thing is, okay, stimulus is coded in the brain. What else? How do you store this information? What we need is learning. The learning that we're using is Habian learning. So I'm not using it. It's like, uh, this is like the most common learning in the brain. So Donald have hypothesis in 1949 that when an exon of cell A is near to cell B here, as you can see, and the, this is an repeatedly a person only takes part in finding it. Some growth process of metabolic changes happens. Now that can be in many different ways. That growth process is not a single mechanism. There are many different mechanisms. And then the efficiency of A's exciting B is increased. This is HAP's hypothesis. It was proved later by experiments and the paradigm is called long-term condensation. This is one form of learning in brain. So through this learning, the weights are updated and the information is stored. And during recall, what is happening? There's the next question. We have the learning, we are doing the learning, the weights are updated, the synapses are strengthened, which information is stored. Some synapses are weakened too, but I'm not going to talk about today. <laughs> but the question is, during recall, how is this information retrieved? So to do that, we need to understand the network now. So the network that something is very relevant, the other networks too, and I'm going to talk today is the Hopel neural network. So in 1972, Hopel introduced a network neural network for describing learning and recall mechanism in the brain. So we talk about the microsecond and what, how these things are happening at the brain level. So here, 
every neuron, we see a lot of neurons in the column here. Every neuron is connected to all other neurons, but not to itself. But this connection to other neuron is quite excellent. So if I have a neuron, B neuron, A can excite B, B can excite A. So by excitement, A can make B fire, B and make A fire, ultimately. Now, hopefully, neural network is an attractor. So what happens is, there is an, you have an energy function. So during training, you try to minimize this energy function to update the weights. So we train a network with this clean sample, say, order, which is like a bird picture. Later, when you give it a noisy picture, the network is going to clean this pattern. The noisy pattern will be clean, and that is an attractor. Now, this concept of attractor still holds. We, there are multiple evidence that brain is still working as an attractor. It does this cleaning process, and there's a time and accuracy trade-off in going on in the brain. If you give the brain enough time, it is going to give you a very clean result. So that is true. But as you can see, it was 1982. We didn't know enough about the brain. There are many limitations with this Hopel model. Some, uh, it's a good useful model. It's a good starting point, but it is not robust enough for real-world AI problems. So it is not very popular for real-world AI problems. And from a biology point of view, this A connected to B and B connected to B, this symmetry is not biologically plausible. There is no bidirectional connection in the brain, most of the cases. And Neurons are much more complex, and the synapses can be very different types. There are AMPA and NDA synapses, et cetera, or inhibitory synapses, the GABA is it. And this kind of network ignores gamma oscillations, which is something you might have heard a lot in popular science, brain oscillations. And definitely, it is not, it is not suitable for learning in the wild. So the goal that we, that the thing that we're trying to do is like design robust olfaction in spite attractor for learning in the wild. This is the thing that we, try, we have been trying to do here. So this is still an attractor, but it's much more biologically possible. And we are trying to overcome the limitations of this kind of networks for learning in the world. So very this is what I'm going to talk. So this is very interesting in the sense that, you know, Hopfield Network has, you know, made a huge progress when it came out in 1982 in terms of uh, things we didn't know how to do. But it still, you know, has limitations in terms of the problems, especially like in a neuromorphic area, to be able to use Hoffit network to, you know, for learning systems, basically. It's very interesting. Okay, go ahead. I want to hear the rest now. So, yeah, so this other work, <laughs> a bit of bragging time for me. So, <laughs> so this work got published in like our we became very popular through our work. So, it was in communications of ACM and many other. Mm -hmm intense publications. So this work became very popular that this olfaction inspired work. And what exactly this work is? Now I can talk a bit about my PhD work. Till, uh, till now I was only talking about the background. So this is the olfactory bulb, simplified diagram. It is a multilayer network. You have the receptors here. Receptors receive the order information get, and this transmit the, they transmit the information to this Globular layer, which is the first layer here. And in the globular layer, you can see many complicated connections here. But one of the very interesting things that people always get like people people get very excited about this that you have this different kind of gene olfactory receptors. A single receptor has a particular type of gene. And these receptors always converge to a particular glomerular line, a particular column, the square boxes that you see here. There is no like uh, they don't get distributed to different glomerular. They will converge the single glomerular. So thousand different type of genes in rodents, uh, thousand glomerular. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And we can think of order coding in terms of glomerular. Now. So something we call non topographic cell computing. I don't call it my advisor's word. <laughs> That's how I call it. And what is this glomerular layer doing? Very interesting things that is part of my PhD. So it does concentration tolerance, normalization, and also data regularization. It's a very important information learning tool, which I'm going to describe, so don't worry. And this global information, this pre process information, is then fed to the empty, which are the mitral cells. It is part of the external platform layer that you see in pink color. Here, this information is converted into a timing based code, and then information is learned in this granule cells, which in biology we call interneurons. This, there's a learning tool called SPDP, which is very famous in computational neuroscience. And then these granule cells apply inhibitory drive to the mitral cells. And that's how this attractor is created. Now, this is at the end. 
So this information is passed to the higher brain regions like cortex, tubercle, and cortex has a talk back to the bulb. But the story becomes much more complicated. And so I am not talking about this cortex story right now. So I'm only talking about the bulb. And that is part 60, 70 to 70% 60 of my PhD. So I'm going to talk about that. This, mm -hmm. this three layer, uh, mitral to granule, feed forward and granule to mitral. Now learning it a while, we already discussed this. What are the qualities? I'm mentioning three here. Not many, few here. Online lifelong learning without catastrophe forgetting. So we want the network to do lifelong learning, not forget previous things. Now, one thing it's worth mentioning, we do have forgetting in neuroscience, though. like in the brain, we do forget things. Right now, we haven't implemented it in our AI system. There's something we have to think in future. How, what is the significance of it? Like how we do it in a model. So that's a different, that's something that is different in our model compared to Piles right now. And we want the network, we want the order to be lear learned from one of few short samples. We want that to be learned very quickly. Other thing which is we are doing online learning. We need to know when to relearn something. We are doing learning record. We do, it is not, we are always going to learn. Sometimes we say, oh, we don't need to learn this. We already know this. Mm -hmm. So what we need is like a, some kind of a classifier confidence so that we know when we need to learn something. If it is something very new, the classifier confidence will be very, very low. And then we can say, uh, it is not saying the network in biology, it is regulated by neuromodulation. So the updated network, they say, oh, we need to learn this. So those synapses are activated. So we need a classifier confidence. And we want this order to be recognized in highly occluded environments. And concentration tolerance, what does it mean? I have to be more clear here. So what is occurred, very different concentrations, very different intensities in nature. And it is not possible for us to train a model with all possible concentrations in nature. So what we do is like, we train it, and that happens in biology too. We train a network with one uh, concentration order. And then we expect that order to be recognized at higher or lower intensities or concentrations. That kind of also enables few short learning. We can learn from very few examples because we have removed this concentration information. That actually happens at the glomerular layer that I just said. And there are biological, that's something my, done by PhD, that was done by my PhD advisor in 2005, how he discovered, implemented that model. And I kind of modified that model for my neuromorphic implementation. Very nice, mm -hmm. good. And this will be a bit complicated, but don't worry because I still want to say these things. We have this olfactory bulb here. What are the features of the olfactory system that we are trying to replicate? We are trying to replicate the data pre-processing capacity of the olfactory bulb glomerular layer. We are trying to replicate, understand, uh, use the significance of sparse syndrome projections. I'm going to talk about this. And heterogeneous activity levels of system mitral cells. Now, I talk about these empty cells. These are mitral cells. They have sister mitral cells. And there's something better. This work is done was NCPS or IAC in India, actually. They observed that the sister mitral cell had heterogeneous activity levels. But nobody understands why. And that's something I realized through my work that it is very useful for data regularization, mm -hmm. that technique. Mm -hmm. Importance of gamma oscillation, timing-based coding. is something ignored in computational neuroscience uh, because we don't understand it bad, and also definitely not in neuromorphics. Uh, it's very new for neuromorphic too. Now, this is something that's, again, discovered experimentally, that this mitral cell, they have that dendrites. They can excite any of these granule cells. They are, can excite, go and excite any of the granule cells. And these granule cells, learn through an asymmetric STDP. Now, when I started my PhD in 2014, the olfactory bulb was thought of as like a simple filter. People were ignoring this olfactory bulb. The reason is they thought there's not much learning happening. My advisor said, definitely there's learning happening. We don't have enough tools to understand it. And I started with people using this simple STDP rule. Over time, 2017, 2018, a lot of papers came out supporting that there are learning in this olfactory bulb. So now there is a lot of argument that there is learning in the olfactory bulb, but that is not the case in 2014. Mm -hmm. So we are learning and, more about learning basically, about smell, especially, you know, even like within a span of last 10 years from what you are saying. Yeah, because uh, one of the key tools in neuroscience is optogenetics. Mm -hmm. And because of optogenetics, we are now able to do very controlled experiments. Ah, okay, got it. Mm 
Okay. That kind of enables better. So basically, one discovery in one field helps to do, you know, new discovery in another sort of related field because you have the instrumentation in a sense. I mean, instrumentation, I always felt like plays a very important role, having the you know, right sort of instrument. You know, we, do, we didn't have it, you know, like, you know, before, and, but we continually building new instruments that allows you to do the next set of things, you know. There's still scope for in, in designing better near, um, neuroscience experiments. With Absolutely. Lead. So mm -hmm. the granules that you see mm -hmm. here, they're so minor, it's very difficult to record from them. Mm -hmm. and because they receive information from so many brain regions, it's very difficult still to understand how learning is happening there. So I do envision this thing will improve in future. So mm -hmm. as I said, these mitrals can accept any granule cells. They, their nature extend all over the bulb, the EPL, but that is not for inhibition. Inhibition is very local here. Mm -hmm. And this columnar-like organization here. So granule cells can inhibit the mitral cells, shape the mitral cell timing. And that happens only for the nearby mitral cells. Granule cells that are material cells that are nearby to the granule cells. It's very, very local. They cannot go very far. Inhibition cannot propagate. And overall, this is an ecranial network. This external plexiform layer. And we see in this attractor setup, it is performing the role of denoising. And that is again, we wrote a paper on this last year that we did this neuromorphic design. And we observed that based upon the experimental observations, this looks like a denoiser, this entire EPL architecture. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It looks like experimentalists are also thinking now that, oh, it is looks like a denoiser because evolution is happening. So it is not that we experimentalists already know that this is how the brain is working. So we had a lot of neuroscience experiments. They said different things about timings and all. We interpreted those things and came up with the model. That's how it worked. And now we are trying to use this model for neuroscience too, because now we have something to also understand the experimental results. And this is important. The importance of adult neurogenesis in maintaining lifelong learning without catastrophic forgetting. I'll describe this. Uh, so wait, what exactly is this? So these are the features that we are looking. Now I show you this neuron. This is the biological neuron. Here information is at the end, right? Passed through the soma along the exon, through the timeless, this uh, passes passed through the synapse to the other neurons. Keep in mind, there are many different types of neurons. This is a neuron properties vary. So the mitral empty neuron, if you look at the picture here, it's dendrite, which we call apical dendrite, is in the globular layer, but it's soma is in the external pex from here. Whereas these granule cells that you see here, they're interneurons, they don't even have any exon. They're doing computation without exons, it's all dendrites. That's a property of interneurons. So neurons, there is no a single neuron model for all that ap applicable for all the neurons. Different neurons okay. have different models. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, we are dependent a lot on single cell electrophysiology to understand the neuron properties here. <laughs> so how do you understand these neurons? This work was done, it's a Nobel Prize work by Hodgkin Huxley back in 1963, uh, yeah. So they said this neuron can be described in terms of an electric circuit. Now in the neuron, membrane potential is increased when sodium flows into the neuro neuron, sodium ions. And it spikes and then potassium ions starts flowing out. And there's also leak component. That's how the general neuro neuron model, the exceptions always, there's calcium based spike too. Now they has described this neuron in terms of sodium potassium currents. And if you look at the equation, these are super complicated equations. And ion channel conductance, uh, I'll discuss this later. And if you look at these equations here, this voltage here, dV by dt, dependent on currents. And currents, the sodium currents, they in turn dependent on conductance and voltage. And these are simplified equations. This conductance are G and A, uh, they are dependent on membrane, voltage, and time. And they are actually mechanical systems. They are exactly a, like a gating mechanism in the neuron. They op open and close. And as, it, as they are mechanical systems, they are sources of noise too. Now, sources of noise, how much it is, is always debatable, but there's, there's definitely some noise there because it's a mechanical system. It closes and opens the gates. Now, this kind of models are very, these are the go-to models if you want to describe biology exactly. You want to exactly replicate the neuros, neural experiments. That's not something we can do now because the neuromorphic chips that we have in silicon, 
they cannot support Hoxkin Huxley model. These have too many parameters, too many complex dynamics. We do a more simplified, simplified model, which is called spiking neuron. It's something we did, but we keep in mind that we are actually taking inspiration from Hoxkin Huxley models. So one of our lab members do those kind of modelings, and we constantly discuss ideas and how we use those in our simplified models. That's the way we go. So these are spiking neural model. I'm not sure whether you're able to see it because I want, this is the dynamic of a spiking neuron. X axis is time here and Y axis is the moment potential update. So current is coming to this neuron. The moment potential is increasing. The rise is dependent upon moment conductance, G, time constant. If this moment potential exits a threshold, which is the BTH, neurons are going to spike and the voltage will be reset. And that is going to start again. This spike information is transmitted to other neurons. And that's how communication happens in spiking neurons. Neuron spike information transmitted based upon that networks are, network is updated or that if it is inference, networks are not updated. And that information is passed through the output layer. Different mechanisms, different networks. But that's the basic idea, spiking neurons. And most of the neuromorphic chips have this neuron model. Now you might have heard of brain oscillations a lot, right? So it's very popular. You put an easy cap on your head and then the, uh, you record these brain waves. We see this in olfactory system too. So, but I wanted to understand how, what is the mechanism of generation of these waves. Now, the reading models to describe it, a very simp simplified way of understanding is that we have this periodic excitation and inhibition going on in neurons. That kind of generates these kind of oscillations. And the oscillation that we observe with the olfactory bulb, if we remove the other brain is it's gamma oscillation, which we see on top. But what is it doing? But from a microsecretary level, what is its role? Apparently, it, it looks like it works, works like a clock. So that's why we implemented it as a clock in our system. So for doing timing-based coding. So this is more like a, this is an intense slide, but I'll try to simplify it for you. So don't worry. So the idea is that you have, let's imagine you have five inputs, 0 0.95, 0 0.47, 0.7. As per this gamma oscillation coding, you have this gamma oscillation of 25 milliseconds. It's a particular time period. And this is going to repeat. The strongest input will go make the neuron spike first, followed by the second strongest, 0 0.7. And here, if the input is very, very low, it usually is noise. Neurons won't spike. So there will be a kind of noise we're trying to. That is gamma oscillation space coding, precedence coding. And this kind of happens in a single layer. You can have different clock in different layers. And that kind of is something is useful for reconfigurable computing. These three layers that have this clock, they are engaging in this kind of computation. The other two layers are engaged in the other kind of competition. Now, here, the rule is the rule that I mentioned here is called STDP. I don't think I have time to describe this, but there, STDP very simply is that you have this presynaptic neurons, postsynaptic neurons. If there is a causal relationship, it's pre is making the postsynaptic fire, which will be potentiated. But if there is no causal relation, if the pre is not making the post fire, the weights will be repressed. Those will be, will be pruned. That's STDP. And the end of STDP, what you have, what you see is, uh, we have this mitral cell, you have the granule cell, mitral collector granule cell. There is STDP. The connection without learning in a native network is very dense, but after learning, it becomes sparse. There is some spike in nature. Mm -hmm. So we say the network becomes conditioned, and what happens is that due to learning because of this STDP, these granule cells, they will spike to only say a particular order, say orange. They won't spike for uh, lemon or apple because they got conditioned, the way it's got updated. That was the idea. Very interesting. For different smells, it is going to spike differently. So the, yep. the, the height of the spike also matters for, like say, you talked about orange and tangerine, for example. I mean, there's going to be spikes for both of them, I presume, but is the height a factor or you have to think about like a three-dimensional thing instead of a two-dimensional way to look at it? Uh, I have something. So the idea is that uh, your the spike I showed you here, right? It's a spike mm -hmm. business coding. Mm -hmm. You don't fit this direct orange and lemon data here. Okay. You do a lot of pre-processing, so the input is within some range. That is data regularization. Okay, okay, got, got it, okay. And uh, that's coming, yeah. few minutes. I, so, I just want to give you an update. It's about an hour, so I, I'm uh, aware of your time. I want you to optimize the best way you want to you know, cover the rest of it. Yeah, life. I can skip few things now because I am going to skip it. So I'm just going to talk about two important things, the data regression that is just said and 
here's an essay. That'll be like more. So, okay. I can skip this. So this is like the learning from Granul to my turn. It's anyway very complicated. I cannot describe here. <laughs> so we did some testing and we observed here that we can do our network supports online learning. That's the thing we observed. It doesn't suffer from catastrophic forgetting compared to ANN. ANN does suffer from catastrophic forgetting. These are some results. So it's fine. And then we can mitigate dread. So I directly go to the final thing that is as us. So this is the latest, most update, uh, updated work. Just mm -hmm. before my PhD, I did that. We implemented an overall full attractor here, which we call SAPINET. Glomerular layer, principal neurons, mitres, projecting the granule, fitting, fitting back to mitral cells. We designed this network, and this network performs data regulation, classification, and denoising. Uh, okay, so I did, I'll very quickly go through that. So this is a challenge in online learning. You have this okay. wild data. No, no, can you go back to the last slide? You have a three yeah. things. It has a three steps, right? Basically, that's what you are doing. You got the learning, the hardwired, and then excitatory, and then inhibitory. Okay, got it. And then you got the, okay. So data regulation is important, modeling, scaling, and the of course, you still have to do some classification. And then you have a noise that is created. You wanted to get rid of the noise. Okay, okay, let's go on. Yeah. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So I'll describe this very quickly. So here axis, X axis indicates 16 sensors and Y axis indicate three different orders, responses. Mm -hmm. Now you see this why order responses are very different. Are, we mm -hmm. call this data Y. Now mm -hmm. if you look at a particular area, the interneuron spike count for this three spike. So X axis indicate the three different orders. Or neurons, this is a generic problem in machine learning or spiking neuron network. They're widely different. For blue, it is a lot of them are neurons are spiking. For red, none are spiking. That's a big problem. If no, we are dealing with spike-based communication, if neurons don't spike, like we will, it won't detect anything. And that becomes a problem in online learning because we don't know the statistics. We cannot apply, um, we don't, cannot compute the mean and standard deviation of the data. Exactly, that's right. So, you have no data. <laughs> yeah. right. So mm. that's a challenge. And how to solve this? I actually have a solution to that. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's inspired from biology. So we described this method, the same thing mathematically using goodness of preprocessing. I won't have time. So, uh, so what, to study this, what we did was we took synthetic data, wild data. So X axis indicate 100 sensors, imagine, and Y axis indicate the sensor responses. So this data is actually drawn from different distributions like Poisson, uh, uniform distribution, normal distribution, and they are very wild data. Same data, but I'm sorting the data. You'll realize why I'm doing that. So for this kind of data, if you observe for mitral and granule, the x-axis indicated order indices, y-axis indicated spanning, uh, spike, fraction of spikes. They are very different. For some of these orders, they are not spiking for these two layers. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if you apply these data regulation steps, there are many steps involved, like using concentration tolerance, threshold heterogeneity, the heterogeneous duplication, in spite from biology, we can regularize the data. That's something you see here. So after applying these steps, you see that the data is regularized. And you see the spike counts are approximately similar across all the orders. And we don't need to know about the mean and standard deviation. That's a big thing. So we can do online learning. Once sample come, we can do it, regularize it. We know that the neurons are going to spike. So what is happening here, a key thing. So there are many th things hidden here. I, I don't have time. Okay. So we, can you quickly say a little bit more on uh, the general idea of data regularization? Uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of so idea of like data regularization is that we kind of force the data to follow a particular distribution like you see here. So here, the, compared to the previous figure here, where you have a straight line, different curvy data across, here the data is following a particular distribution, like a normal fall here. It's an exponential here, so mm -hmm. except the outline. So data is following a distribution. If right. you fit this kind of data to the network, right. Uh, you see a flat spike count across order samples mm -hmm. that you see here for both the granular. You see these yellow blue curves, they are flat. This one is desired. Now we know that if you're designing an anomaly detection system, say for ECG recognition, we know that we will have a spike for right, this, correct. even for this mm -hmm. wild data. Right. And one of the key things that we observe is, which drives this result, is heterogeneous duplication. So in, in, bio, in neuroscience, people know that they're ET cells. People know that they are mitral cells, system mitral cells. And random position is things that people know it exists, but nobody knows how it plays a role. Okay. So I just projected this ED cells to mitral cells using a sparse in the position mm -hmm. and introduced 
heterogeneity of spiking thresholds of uh, mitral cells and also grand cells. That kind of does the work. It regularizes the data. And this is actually a very powerful regularizer. When I first designed this back in two years earlier, my advisors were excited. I was not very excited, but now I have realized it's important much more. <laughs> mm -hmm. And right. whenever he gives a talk, he talks about this. I was like, why is he talking about this? I mean, it's a simple thing, but now I'm realizing it's importance now. More. Right, right, so. absolutely. Because without having data, you are being able to identify things. That's very important. Yep, great, okay. And next thing is attract and, uh, and I'm going to talk about the next thing. So this is the attract and action, simple example. X axis are the 16 sensors and Y axis are the sensor responses. Blue sample is the clean sample. Oh, sorry, or is the, red is the uh, clean sample and blue is the noisy version. So in the first uh, cycle, blue and red are different. The spike, these Y axis are the spike timings and X axis are the mitral cells. The spike timings are different. So that's because red is uh, blue is noisy. Now the role of attractor is to clean this, the noisy. So after a few cycles, the red and blue dots overlap. So we now know the attractor is working. So the data is being cleaned. Mm -hmm. And this is the overlay attractor. So that's good. Now, this is probably the last thing I'll talk. Neurogenesis, what exactly is this? So it's a process by which new neurons are generated in the brain. Now, I was shocked when I came to know about this after moving to Cornell. So there's this no adult neurogenesis dogma. So the, there's this great scientist called Ramani Kahal. He's a great scientist. He wanted to, he had an interest in the regeneration of the injured brain. He couldn't discover any adult neurogenesis there. This was in early 1900s. And this is the thing until 1990s that there is no adult neurogenesis, especially in rodent. But now we know that rodent olfactory bulb has adult neurogenesis. Humans mm -hmm. still debatable. So mm -hmm. rodents, we know that all, and Experiments have shown in our lab, these are more behavioral experiments and some other labs too, that older, uh, neurogenesis has a role in auto perception. That's a, there's a connection there. And neurogenesis occurs in two reasons, uh, olfactory bulb and also in hippocampus. There are a few differences. Now here in the bulb, neurogenesis occurs in the glomerular layer and also in this granule cells, in inhibitor neurons. In my model, I have neurogenesis only in the granule cells. The reason is we don't understand much about the role of neurogenesis in the glomerular layer, which are waiting for neuroscientists to tell us. The hypothesis is that because this glomerular layer is exposed to the disorders, they get destroyed. These neurons kind of get destroyed, so you need to refurbish, you need more neurons. That's the hypothesis right now. But we will wait for a few more years probably for neuroscientists to tell us. So we don't have, we have neurogenesis only in the glomerular granule cells. What happens? We observe that in this attractor, when we train the network in a normal machine learning setting for learning the wild, so I mean, normal machine learning data, electronic noise data, without neurogenesis, the network classification performance drops. So performance is improved when you have neurogenesis. We wanted to understand what is happening. It's important. So what we did was like this, we trained a network sequentially in a sequential manner. X axis are the five orders, six orders, and Y axis are the granule cell spike recruitment, spike counts. As we go on learning zero to one, two order, three, four, five order, spike count of granules has decreased. As you can see, it is zero, zero, zero. The color is changing from yellow to blue, purple. But if we have neurogenesis here, it restores the granules at spike count. You have now more granules that's available for learning new orders. That is why neurogenesis is important for Very learning, for learning new orders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from a competitional point of view, uh, this is a very important finding, everybody's saying, so let's <laughs> So that's it. And the summary is, we designed an olfaction inspired neural network for learning in the wild. We observed that heterogeneity is important for network performance. One heterogeneity which I talked about, there are many I didn't, sparse heterogeneous weight matrix in et mc projection, they regularize data. Adult neurogenesis is essential for lifelong learning. Inhibitor drive on mitral cell per granule cell is columnar and is essential for data denoising. Learning in the wild can mitigate sensitive. I didn't talk about this because there's short of the timing. And our network uses some properties like precise spike time, local accelerator and inhibitor learning and recurrence. Based upon recent work on neuromorphic, there's some recent papers. These are desired features of neuromorphic algorithms. If you have these features, you're going to benefit more with neuromorphic chips, like your power consumption will be lower. So 
that kinds of that makes the algorithm more suitable for neuromorphic implementation. And that's it. I need to thank my <laughs> advisor, Tom Cleland, my committee, Al Molnar, David Field, Smith, and Thorsten, lab mates, Christian was a collaborator, funding agencies. The Intel guys helped me a lot in designing this. So that's it. Thank you. Very good, Ion. This is uh, really, really good um, what you talked about. Very interesting in disconnecting different pieces. I think uh, there are few questions. One general question is that, you know, uh, in the, uh, we talk about smell. I mean, you talked about smell rather uh, and, and, and in a neuromorphic aspect, but, uh, you know, with uh, bringing into something more recently relevant, uh, COVID-19, with COVID-19, if you tested positive, you lose the sense of smell. So how do you connect those sort of things with neuromorphic uh, sort of aspect of it? So. <laughs> I, as I probably have, don't have a clear idea, to be honest. <laughs> so I received a project proposal during COVID last from Monal Chemical Science probably, yeah. that they had this COVID data and they want to use, test it on my algorithm. So, but as of now, we don't know much. So, okay. no, no, that's okay. That's a that's a good answer. I mean, I don't expect it to be, but it was an interesting question. The other no, question I mean, that 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 has come up uh, from a, uh, one of the participants is that um, the, it's a more a general question from how you you know because you learn software development and you have AI ML experience in the industry. Uh, different from the one you are working on, right? So, uh, you, you know, so the, the question is that, you know, how if algorithm development takes up a major chunk of your work and it's a software development, how do you, how do you actually, um, 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 how do you actually go about getting into a field like this in, in, the, in the context of, you know, um, uh, being able to understand and apply the things you have learned. Okay, I can tell you what I did. <laughs> so, I, I first I was an electrical engineer. I got exposed to circuits, and then I worked at a wet lab in ISC. So I started a visual neuroscience system. And at Cornell, I divided my years. So first two three years, I devoted to learning psychology and neuroscience. So it was like, I took courses. I also, I in fact also took a social psychology course because I, I thought that will also be useful for my work. Mm -hmm. So Cornell had this, gave me this advantage. Like they said, you can do this. So you can take courses in psychology, neuroscience department, you can attend seminars. Those are very important. Now it's, these days we also have MOOCs or massive open line courses. So these are all ways to learn more about Okay. Computational neuroscience, neuro okay. behavior, psychology, all. And then I started again. I went back to engineering. So for, after first three years at Cornell, I went back to engineering. I okay. started taking again a lot of AI courses mm -hmm. and a lot of algorithms. And I tried to merge those ideas. So it is not that I couldn't, it's not possible to do everything together. That's correct. So right. I had so to divide my time, like for two years, two years. So first four to five years, I took a lot of courses at Cornell. Correct. Some research. And especially, you know, if it's a field in a sense, psychology, you didn't have a background. I mean, we don't get that background to start with. And then, you know, because of our educational system, the way it is set up, unfortunately, it doesn't allow to mix <laughs> things up. You know, that's a different problem. But the question, another question related question is that, what is the major chunk of time it took? Is what the algorithm development? Obviously the thinking process is an important part of the time it took you for looking into this. Uh, or, or the algorithm development or the implementation or the, you know, and making sure that you are doing everything, you know, uh, correctly within the assumptions you started with. Uh, you, you make some assumptions, but that doesn't mean that assumptions will always be true. You need to update those assumptions very frequently. So it's a very, when I started this build, there was like, Everything was kind of half done. So I built at Cornell, probably also in my lab at Cornell, I was the first one who did neuromorphic. So I had to build a lot of the things there. So we don't, as of now, just so you know, there are no, we have PyTorch, say, TensorFlow for doing ANN. 
But for doing SNN kind of architectures, we had to design our own SNN framework. Mm -hmm. So we also yeah. had to develop our software framework. Algorithms, we had to build our algorithms from scratch. So it is not that we use a ResNet or some architectures. That is not okay. something mm -hmm. we have the advantage right now. Uh, probably things are getting better now because field is maturing now. And and what I had at that time, I remember, I had this single cell electrophysiology data of synapse timings. And some experiments showing that across gamma oscillations, the timing was once, once per gamma cycle. That's where I started with. And I started with designing single neurons, then network, and like then trying to make this model more uh, kind of AI goal, because it's very hard otherwise. So for, in fact, for the first two years, I started going to neuroscience conferences. Yeah, right. because it was more neuroscience work at that time. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, this is really, really great. Uh, I really thank you for your time. And it's a very interesting uh, topic, very interesting talk, the way you presented it. You gave the introductory background to the, the folks who, you know, including me, not knowing a lot about things. And I appreciate you put the time to put together a, a, a talk like this. Obviously, as, I, as you can see, we recorded the talk and it will be there. Uh, is it possible for you to share the uh, slide deck that you have, or do you have any concern about sharing that? Uh, I can do a few things and then I can share it. Okay, good. Then we can make yeah. it more broadly available to the community. Yeah. Um, so I can okay. tell you one more thing quickly because you, I think I forgot to tell you. Uh, if you want to learn more about neuromorphic, there are two workshops that really help. So I went to the Telluride Neuromorphic Cognition Workshop. Mm -hmm. That is held yearly. Now they have an online version, so people from India can attend it too. There's also Kepokechia in Italy. They might have make it, made it online too. These are really two good workshops for learning about neuromorphic. Mm -hmm. It's not a very big community, but the people across the world who are doing neuromorphic, we gather for three weeks and try to come up with interesting ideas. and. That's a way to learn more about neuromorphic. Very good. I am um, excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, I posted the link to the feedback form. That will be very helpful to get some feedback. And you know, so uh, from the, those attendees, and obviously, do those who complete the feedback, uh, they will also get a e certificate for attending the webinar. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Ion, for your great talk. And we'll talk more later. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question actually. Are you closing now? Uh, you, you can go you can ahead ask. and uh, uh, do it, uh, you know, ask a question. I have not stopped the stream yet. Sure. Um, actually, I have two questions. First, uh, congratulations, Ayan, that, that is a very excellent work you are doing. And your work has a tremendous futuristic aspect. And I'm, I have my question is if you could go back to your slide 11. Slide 11? Yeah. Mm. BMI. Yeah. You, you're talking about the prosthetic, right? So I'm wondering uh, because uh, how the command goes, like, is it a two way command? Like, uh, because in our real life, you know, with our hand, if we feel something, then uh, our brain gives a command to do the action, right? So how does it work with your neuromorphic system? So is it like two way command? Like uh, if you feel something with your prosthetic and then it will sense and give back the information to the brain and process it and then the action will happen? So, yeah. So the, the term that we use is closed loop systems, closed loop okay. feedback system. Okay. And brain gives the information, the information is fed back. So is, and ideally, you, what you also want is a predictive system, which also predicts what the brain is going to say at some point. So, so yes, it is a closed-loop system. So most of the neuromorphic goal is to implement in closed-loop systems. Okay. So that, with that, uh, I have another question. Like Because we know that uh, to implement AI, we need a lot of memory, right? How do we handle this when we do a biomimic? Uh, you are talking about a robot which can sense the smell. Right. So to sense the smell, you need to feed a lot of data into his brain. And how do you handle the memory issue? That's a very interesting question. So I actually skipped that part. Mm -hmm. Usually, if you design AI algorithms, memory is a hurdle, what you're saying, right? So 
in addition to this neural, uh, neural circuitry, we also want to have a decoder and encoder. We, before this, we have an encoder which, and some kind of processor, which actually processes this information, some kind, uh, maybe FFT, whatever that is. And there are ways to optimize it, actually. So we, by the way, we actually do is use genetic models. We try to use a predictive setup, so we don't use all of the data. Here, if it's a temporary data, we use a chunk, few chunk of the data and try to start predicting. So don't need to store using this few chunk of data, you can start the predictions. That's one way to go. And other is we, I think I refer to this very thing. This uh, something we are dependent on memory guys. Not I'm not the memory guy right now. So we are thinking about on-chip learning and on-chip memory. So we, if uh, our, if you're concerned about uh, learning and all, then it will be all on-chip ideally using local learning. That kind of reduces a lot of the learning related challenges using in AI, AIs. So it's a bit different <laughs> from standard AI here. Uh, I do have one very general question because you are in that field. So you know, you can see the future from 10 years from now. So what do you think, like how far we can go with this AI technology? For example, will there be any, in future, will there be any technology that uh, will help a blind people can see? Because I see that neuromorphic could have some application in th those kind of uh, artificial vision. Do you think that uh, in near future, we are going in that direction? Uh, so there's already some work in Australia going on. There's a team which is already doing that work. Okay. And if you ask me in a few years, so I can tell you in this way. In the next four or five years, the way neuromorphic will be useful in some edge computing devices, tiny ML kind of things, where you are not concerned about learning. Learning is done somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Places where we are concerned about privacy, where we don't want to put the data to cloud. We want to do everything at the edge. That's one of the most potential application of neuromorphic. And then, as the electrical engineers come up with better memory technologies, uh, non volatile memories, we can start thinking about putting this in robotics, like using those algorithms, learning groups in robotics, because we need better memory technologies. The current memory technologies are not suitable for even for neuromorphic, so they are not compatible exactly. So they have to be cost effective because ultimately we want to sell this in a chip, right? So million, we want to sell millions of chips. So that will be 10 years from now. But there are many challenges right now. So okay. I'm a bit careful when I say talk to these things. Okay. One of the major challenges in neuromorphic is that we have to think in terms of spikes. With, there are not many spike-based algorithms right now. And that's something we always face. People get excited about neuromorphic. They know traditional machine learning. And then they don't understand how spikes work. And it kind of stops there. And this has happened even in the US. So we personally, I feel like we need to start educating people more about spike-based communication, spike-based learning. And so that people, we need to make the code public and also that people can start designing things. So these are all things that we need to do in the future. Do you think your technology could also help uh, to give, suppose one person, he was paralyzed. So because this all because of the neuron, right? So do you think it can be helpful to give him back the normal life that he deserved. So I have been working, collaborating with a person at Toronto for that project. It's a deep brain stimulation kind of thing. I so see. very interesting. Yeah, so that's possible project. So that's where I say the predictive system thing is useful. You need to know what you are going to stimulate, like how, what kind of stimulus you need to predict. Yeah. Here you need a predictive system which actually maps with the neural dynamics and we have these neural chips, which can be basically, the parameter, parameters can be easily tuned as per the neurons, say as per the basal ganglion, and then you can apply those dynamics. The difference is that right now it will be silicon. So that's something people are also thinking, maybe you can make it more organic electronics or something. Future, not now. Great, thank you. Thank you, Manus, for your question. Thank you again to Ion for your great presentation and you know answering all the questions that came up. I'm going to stop the recording now. Stop. Okay. Uh, if you have more questions, you can always email me. I shared my email at the first slide. So I'll be happy to reply. Great.